1990 to 2010. Uh, in 1991, I was uh, in Canada doing part of my PhD. We were sequencing with uh, uh, radioactivity, S25. We were discussing how many samples because they were so much expensive. And uh, behind the screens and uh, all that stuff, and at the same time, uh, I read uh, the book, uh, Jurassic Park, which became a book. And uh, the author was uh, writing that uh, uh, they sequenced from uh, all these animals, uh, massive sequencing of uh, this, and we were saying, oh, that's science fiction. And just 12, uh, 20 years later, and the cost of mega base drops down to four cents, which was, and uh, we can produce in one month or in one day millions of, uh, of bases. I mean, all this technology grows and uh, goes much faster than we can imagine. And what we can do and we should do is to incorporate them in our daily life uh, as much uh, what we can do is to, to take them to try either people uh, to find people who can uh, bring this technology to uh, the farms and to daily life and to the breeding programs and to incorporate them to get finally more money for uh, uh, the industry the agricultural industry okay so what I'm going to, uh, to talk is uh, because I'm mostly on the qualitative genetics uh, part, I'm going to uh, talk about the of uh, all the animals, fresh, uh, fresh water fish, they are uh, much more, and uh, marine, they're not so many, but in total, is a big industry. In 2001, uh, oh, uh, Gerd, uh, who's a uh, Norwegian, very well known, uh, in genetics, uh, he presented that there were family-based family-based breeding programs. There were just 39, and uh, at that moment here in Greece, we had two programs just at the very beginning. Uh, actually, were the programs of Nireos. When I was in Nireos, we had just uh, started this and uh, well Nireos uh, became another program and uh, we continued some other, uh, some uh, others uh, so there were 39 programs and uh, in 2010 again from the same teams from the Norwegians the information uh, say that we have a hundred programs, breeding programs. Too many, as you see. Uh, they are for uh, freshwater fish and uh, some for uh, sea bass and sea breed. Sea bass and sea breed. Three for sea bass and four for, for sea breed, which are the, for the species that we are interested in. What is the purpose of uh, a breeding program? Is to increase the welfare of the farm uh, animals through the domestication. The domestication will give better fish uh, for production, for growth, for uh, uh, farming, and of course to increase productivity of animals and to improve their product quality. That's the purpose of a breeding program. 
course, uh, if you want to, to ask or uh, discuss something, you uh, you can do it through the presentation. Now, a genetic improvement or genetic progress is a uh, is the result of changing the gene frequency. What the linear said, he described all the uh, possibilities on uh, the technology to identify each uh, gene. Segments of DNA, either genes that they have a certain uh, code for to, to produce uh, a protein, or the uh, segments of DNA that they don't have a certain function, at least we don't know now, uh, and uh, it's called junk DNA. But both of them, they, they have, they might have different uh, frequencies. So, genetic improvement is to change this gene frequency in a breeding uh, population in the favor of uh, some, uh, some genes or some alleles that uh, they give us better characteristics. Better growth, better disease, uh, uh, disease resistance, or whatever, better fat content, whatever. There are four forces that can change the gene frequencies. It's the genetic drift, mutation, selection, and migration. The genetic drift just changes the gene frequency uh, by chance. It's a characteristic of small population. All in this uh, uh, room, we have small populations. We work with small populations, relatively small. So <coughs> genetic drift is one of the forces that uh, uh, may play a big uh, role. We will talk about later. Mutation is the change in the structure of uh, genetic material. Actually, is what Adelino described before. All this technology that uh, dissects into the DNA finds mutations uh, among the individuals and mutations that are <coughs> among the population. Selection. Sele in the selection process, uh, some animals reproduce more than others because we decide to do that because they have a uh, certain phenotype, which means a certain genotype. And finally, migration is moving animals among populations uh, which differ, population, the population which differ in uh, their gene frequencies. Now, these are the four forces. The two genetic drift and mutations are unpredictable. We cannot predict them. Mutation can happen uh, for many reasons, because of uh, UV radiation, because of a chemical, because of whatever, uh, and then pass to the next generation. Genetic drift is unpredictable. It's the change by chance of gene frequencies in a small, especially in small populations. Imagine that we we have, uh, let's say, 100,000 fish. We get 10 to make them uh, uh, brothers, we don't know how the gene frequency will change. It will go up for some genes and down for um, some others. And uh, but if we, if we get from a hundred thousand the fifty thousand, we can imagine that the gene frequency of the hundred thousand will be the same uh, as uh, if we get the, the fifty thousand and make them parents. So. In these uh, two uh, populations, will not change. So these two are uh, unpredictable. Selection and migration are the tools for the program. We select fish and we migrate them. We take them from one population to the other, from one brutus of tank to the other, and uh, in order to cross them and do whatever we want. Also, 
condition uh, here, uh, which actually says that genetic drift is uh, what, what we're going to avoid and mutation, selection, and uh, migration is uh, are the forces that we're going to exploit. And we will exploit them either through the classical qualitative genetics, classical breeding way, uh, or the incorporation of uh, the breeding way and the genomics uh, uh, tools. So, a date of economic importance, uh, well, most of the dates of economic uh, importance are quantitative. What does it mean? It means that these trades are uh, trades that uh, many genes are involved in, in the, the expression, and uh, we have too many uh, genotypes and too many phenotypes for that. And of course, they have the environment has a significant effect uh, in, the, in this variability, which has to be. Uh, put aside, and uh, we have to, to uh, see on the genetic part of that uh, trait. So, as we said, these traits are multifactorial, they are affected by a high number of genes and uh, with small individual effects. And now, here we have just a uh, an icon, a picture of uh, of having two genes with two alleles, and if we assume that each allele gets a number, the small letters get zero, the uh, big letters get one. All the combination will give us something which is well known as a bell curve. Now, if we can imagine that we go uh, more genes, this curve will be uh, dissected and we will have more categories, but the curve will still remain a belt curve. And this is a typical curve of a quantitative trait. In some cases, Major genes that uh, might initially be present uh, can reach fixation uh, under, under selection. And now we begin to, uh, to handle all this information. And the information that we have in the farm is just this one. It's the, uh, is the phenotypes, okay? and uh, the, the distribution of each phenotype in our population. This is the information, but this information comes from the genotypes and uh, from many genes in most of the cases, and major genes in some of the cases. And we can uh, handle, handle them through genomic uh, strategies. Good. So, again, if we have many individuals and many uh, genes, we get this bell shape curve, uh, which might be a body weight curve. Uh, having categories with different frequencies, with a mean, let's say uh, 350 or whatever, and then if we select a proportion of these individuals, we can get the next generation and make them parents, we can get the next generation, and the difference between these two generations will give us the genetic gain of a uh, uh, of the two uh, generations. And this is what we want in the farm. 
Is that correct? Yeah. So the better, the, uh, the more we get, the more uh, satisfied we'll be. And uh, in order to get that, <coughs> to get more, we need to be confident in our process. And uh, we'll see how we can do that. So now we are the conventional uh, breathing, so which exploits this uh, normal distribution and through selection and uh, through reality genetic variability, and we can get all the uh, benefits from that. And of course, we can use cross breeding, which is another technique uh, which does not exploit the genetic, uh, the additive genetic uh, variability and uh, gives some result just for uh, one generation. The conventional breeding accounts for 95 of uh, the genetic improvement in livestock and uh, aquaculture uh, species. Uh, because it's what has been done in most of the terrestrial animals and uh, it was the first to be applied in, uh, in the breeding for aquaculture. What it gives us, gives us a ladder, step by step, accumulating the genetic gain, going from the base population to the third, fourth, or whatever generation, uh, accumulating all the genetic gain that uh, you can get. And of course, cannot be planned for uh, just a few years, but should be planned for um, a long term, so you can, uh, so it can be planned properly, and uh, we we should never be uh, in a hurry to get the genetic gain. Otherwise, we will have problems in other genetic aspects. For example, if we are in a hurry, imagine that we have a population that we get uh, after much uh, spawning, and uh, we have them there, uh, is either Sibin or Sibas, and uh, we have uh, 100,000, we select 10 better. Now we all know that uh, they are better, but selecting that, we don't have any information on the genetic background. So this means that can uh, uh, lead us in uh, uh, risks that uh, we don't even know the risk of inbreeding, the risk of uh, selecting an individual which grew better, but not for genetic reasons, because uh, environmental reasons, because uh, it ate more, uh, not necessarily for genetic reasons, uh, and we can select just for one uh, trait. Now, if we go to another strategy, which is family or combined selection, then we can uh, have breeding candidates selected according to the performance of it, their own and their relatives. So we have more information about each individual. So we increase our confidence for selection of uh, that individual. can be applicable to all trades and the information, all this information can be combined and uh, put uh, in a uh, multifactorial system uh, or equation and then uh, give, give us an index so to, uh, to select. And um, of course, we have other things like inbreeding control, more efficient, but they're more costly. So the difference are individual selection and family 
based election. In fish, <coughs> we do have uh, a problem. Eggs are very small, and uh, the, the fry is very small. It's very difficult to, and especially in our species, it's very difficult, although it can be done, uh, to make families. So, uh, one approach is the genomic approach. The, the application of the uh, uh, beginning is to apply markets to that uh, system. So, we can have the separation and the construction of the families. We will see later. Now, how much can we expect or uh, how, uh, how can we predict the genetic gain? It's a simple equation. The genetic change per year depends on the accuracy of our estimation, the intensity of our selection, the genetic variation per year, and the generation uh, length. So if we can play with this uh, terms of uh, the numerator, then we can increase or decrease, depending of uh, on our action, the the change, the genetic change. So, if we get this simple equation in more mathematical way, for a mass selection, this genetic gain will depend on the heritability, the intensity of the selection, and the phenotypic standard deviation, okay? The phenotypic standard deviation is the normal distribution that we have. We have. The intensity of the selection uh, means that we have 100,000 individuals, candidates, and we select 10 or 100 or 1,000. This proportion, proportion that we said so before, this proportion, is the intensity of the selection, okay? And the heritability, which is uh, in qualitative genetics a very important uh, term, uh, show that, shows how much of the phenotypic variation that we have in our case, in our population, is additively genetic. Not only gene in genetic in the whole sense, well, there is another heritability in the whole sense, uh, but how much is additive? How much depends on the genes that add all together to give us this distribution? And of course, we can put another term, <coughs> which is the inbreeding depression, uh, depending on the relationship of the uh, group cell. That's for the mass selection for a single term. Uh, to put this up the slides huh? with this. No. Well, I had uh, another slide uh, which shows for the uh, family based selection, uh, which is not that different. Well, the difference is the curious term and this uh, variation. In that in uh, that case, the heritability change in the accuracy of uh, the correlation between the phenotype and the true breeding value uh, of the individual. And this becomes the genetic, not the phenotypic, but the genetic standard de deviation. So that means that we go more uh, into the, the, the analysis of the phenotypic and genetic variation, and we start exploiting the genetic and not only the phenotypic variation.
Okay. I think I heard some, 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 something else, but I don't remember now. Uh, now, how this can be achieved? The classical framework is that uh, it uh, is composed by two distinct parts. It's the mixed model and the infinitesimal genetic, genetic model. If you, you don't know, uh, have to know. The mixed model is this equation. A phenotype, which is analyzed into several parts is uh, the fixed effect part, which is what we do. We have populations in different cages, because we, we have decided to put them in different cages. You know that there is big variability in the body weight between different cages, because it's environmental. So that's a fixed effect. Uh, and we have uh, from different from the production of the uh, family, which is a random thing. It can be the uh, brute fish A, but can be the brute fish B, uh, because it's more or less similar if we have uh, this situation. So we have an equation where we have a phenotype, that's the only thing that we definitely know. The fixed effects, the random effects, these are incident uh, matrices. Uh, it says how they, um, these dec decisions were uh, created. I mean, this is the family structure, and this is uh, this, this describes from how many cages we analyze, and we have the residual, which is the environmental uh, the environment. If we see it another way, we know the phenotype, we know this, we have decided to be from different cages, we can know in family based this, this is the family structure, okay? We either uh, do it by uh, artificial insemination or using other things, and we don't know, and we have to estimate these parts. And these parts are estimated from this mixed model equation. We don't care about that. We have, we want to estimate these two things. So, in order to get a better genetic gain, we need to be more accurate in the measurement of the phenotypes. I mean, it's not enough to say that this piece has a uh, is sick, okay? This fish is sick because uh, it has some lesions. Well, better. This fish is, uh, is sick because it has four lesions. Better. Four uh, too big and too small. Better. So it's a uh, it's very important to describe in the best way, and uh, the best way for a quantitative trait is to try to find a way to measure things, uh, so in order to be accurate in this part. Okay? Now, the other is to be accurate in the estimation of the breeding values. These are the breeding values. And what is the breeding value? The breeding value is the, the sum of the genes that one individual has and will pass it will make it better breeder, will pass it to the next generation. So this is the breeding value, and this, from the whole equation, this is what we want to estimate. And of course, <coughs> to have a reasonable setup and control all the fixed effects, which might increase us, if we don't have a control, we might increase the environmental part and uh, interfere with all this uh, uh, with the analysis and the final decision. And now we have genomics. 
we're going to, to, to be accurate in the quantitative uh, part of our breeding program. We're, we're going to be accurate. In the farm level, we're going to be accurate. Uh, we can be. Just a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Before you start this, let's use your presentation <coughs> not to lose any slides. Before, here. So here comes genomics, and uh, where is genomics? Although uh, I didn't describe it before, uh, is the study of the genome of the organisms. And uh, some disciplines, uh, which in fact they start uh, adding up, are the functional genomics, which is the characterization of genes and their mRNA and protein products, the structural genomics, which is the structure of uh, the uh, of the DNA on the chromosomes and how uh, the segments of the chromosomes are. Uh, are put, uh, uh, the, the segments of uh, DNA are put into the, the chromosomes and uh, it's comparative genetic genomics which shows from one point of view the evolutionary relationships from, but from the applied point of view it gives us the opportunity to bring information from other species to our species uh, we have epigenomics uh, uh, and uh, epigenetics, which are uh, processes that uh, interfere with the uh, uh, with the expression of uh, the genes and modify later on the <coughs> uh, their effect and their phenotype as well. And pharmacogenomics, and we have more, and we will have more in the next uh, years. Now, as I said before, what we want to do is to improve accuracy, is to have better estimation of you, to increase, or to, to increase the genetic gain, which is this one, to improve the accuracy. We, uh, we have to improve the accuracy. We have to improve the estimation of the genetic variation to be more accurate on this part and not having only the phenotypic which is uh, affected by the environment and to shorten the generation uh, interval. This will give us a bit of number, uh, uh, a larger number here and having a larger number here we have a generation that grows faster that have uh, much uh, is uh, much more uh, resistant to a disease uh, or to have better ca characteristics as we want them as uh, breeders. How we can do that is first through the development of the genetic or the molecular markers as Adelina described and we have in general two types of markers the type 1 which is the coding sequences either known or not known either <coughs> known as a gene, we would say growth hormone, or not known, and which are called expressed sequences, sequence tags, which are sequences that are coding, but we don't know for what are coding for, uh, or the candidate genes, and type 2 markers, which are anonymous DNA segments, which might be mitochondrial DNA, RFLP, rabbits, AFLPs, microsatellites, SNPs, and some of these categories might go to the other, uh, uh, to the other uh, type. So, Adelino talked about these. We can use them. We can use them to do, uh, to incorporate them into a breeding program, applied 
this. How? We can, first of all, apply all these markers, and uh, mostly the Microsoft lights, but also the mitochondria, uh, for a parental analysis. Why? It can give us, it can create the family structure, which is the prerequisite to solve this equation. If we don't know the, the family structure, we don't have this term. So we cannot do and do, uh, we cannot go on and make precise estimations. So we can have accurate pedigree construction using microsatellites. These are so, so much variable uh, markers that uh, we can distinguish one individual, uh, the, the two files of uh, one individual among 100 or uh, even even bigger population. Uh, we can uh, use, for example, the mitochondrial DNA to control the genetic diversity and finally to control the, uh, the inbreeding. So we have a better control of the livestock and the processes and every day processes. I mean, uh, you, can, uh, you can think that uh, many times in your uh, day uh, life, uh, you wonder, okay, should we put this brood uh, stop with the other? Should we do it? Should we not do it? Not only in terms of disease, but uh, in terms of changing the uh, uh, mapping. So mapping is arranging markers together, either on chromosomes, which is the physical mapping, the real chromosomes. And here we see a metaphase uh, picture. And we see that some segments, you see these dots here, are mapped on some real chromosomes. This is a physical mapping. And there are, there are uh, more techniques for that. We don't go on it. Or in leakage groups, which uh, uh, represent most of the times the chromosomes, sometimes we, they don't. Uh, and uh, these are called genetic maps. And uh, they're based on how far they are, not in a physical way, but in a genetic way. Cindy Morgan, that Adelino mentioned before. So here we have the map of linkage group one, the chromosome one of uh, uh, CBAS, and we have the markers on it, and we have the uh, <coughs> the, mark the markers that genotype for this particular world, and we have also this uh, gene which effect uh, was found to be uh, significant uh, as a QTL for growth, okay? So we will see it again later. So we have mapped together. That's the uh, first chromosome, LG1, the first chromosome of CB, that was CBAS, is much larger, as you see. Sibling, and uh, we have marked the markers. We have screened the, these markers for uh, the chromosome for a number of individuals. We have uh, taken the phenotypes. We have done the analysis, and uh, also described the, uh, how we do that, and uh, then. We have discovered here one QTL which is promising for uh, growth. And what is QTL? QTL are genes coding for the quantitative traits. We don't, uh, we do not know them. 
uh, we can, from this uh, analysis and from mapping, we can place them between markets. But as the technology goes on uh, and sequencing becoming more cheaper and more, more faster, we can even go and see which is the gene, which, which are the candidate genes, then check every gene and find the gene that is really affecting the same, this particular trait. And uh, uh, this is the answer to uh, Ms. Barandi. Uh, so this, uh, find this gene that affects the, the particular traits and find other genes that affect different traits and then from the general genetic variation we are going into more specific genetic variation so if we say that for uh, body weight the genetic variation the heritability is 0.4 that says that 40 percent of the phenotypic variation is attributed to the genetic variation going into QTL, we can say that 15 of the 40 percent is attributed to this. So we go and we can select more precisely and we can increase the accuracy. And as we said before, <coughs> the quantitative traits are traits that are affected from many genes. And uh, also, uh, the other way around stands. One gene affects too many traits. So we can also dissect doing that. We can also dissect the information and see if this QTL or if this gene, if we can find the mapping, how it will affect other uh, traits, for example, disease resistance, uh, and uh, how can we avoid to select for that, or what do we lose if we don't, don't select for that uh, because it's correlated to other traits, this particular gene, because now we do have the correlation of the two quantitative uh, traits in a classical breeding way of two uh, quantitative traits but we have the correlation of their, let's say, genetic variations, of their variations. Here we have particular segment, particular gene that can correlate to two different days, and we could be more accurate. And uh, this approach is ideal for things with low heritability. Because <coughs> the low heritability, if you remember from this, uh, the genetic gain equation depends on the heritability, <coughs> the genetic gain. And uh, since the one term is small from in the numerator, the genetic gain will go uh, will go down. So if we can find genes that uh, correlate to this uh, uh, to this trait, we can more be more accurate in our uh, in our selection and of course we can do comparative mapping where we can find more QTL from other organisms and then transfer them to the organ with organ so uh, genomics and molecular genetics aims to finally select QTLs or genes, uh, either directly, selecting the desired allele per QTL uh, or QTL, indirectly selecting the marker which is next to, uh, to the, uh, this gene. Now, uh, you have to, to, to remember also slides, the linear slides, to uh, do gene assisted selection in a uh, select a known gene in a, in a broader uh, uh, context of uh, of the genome, 
the mass, the market assist, assist the selection, select uh, market lead, which is the, the entire, and now, which is the, the last one, uh, in uh, the development, which is genomic selection, which is which actually is mass selection, but but in a genome-wide scale. We don't go to the chromosomes. We don't go to segments of chromosomes, but the genome uh, as a whole. So uh, we apply many more markers on the genome, and we select genomes. We will select. Okay, it's the very beginning. We will select uh, genomes. Uh, so all these things will increase the accuracy of the final e breeding equation, which is the breeding equa equation, and will give us a better genetic gain. That's the idea for the breeder. This is what the, the company wants, get genetic gain. And how, this is how all these new technologies can be applied and can be incorporated into the breeding uh, program. And I'm finished. Any questions? Of course, that's. Is it possible to combine uh, public selected breeding programs with genomics? That means that you have some traits probably uh, that are manipulated from the family based uh, project, and uh, also you can have in parallel traits that are uh, uh, investigated more from genomics. So you can combine the final selection, the results that you have from both methods. All right. or get involved in a research program to get more information and then use your families to identify GTLs. Once you have identified the GTLs from your family, you have incorporate them into this family-based program. But uh, in order to go on and use them generation by generation, you need you, uh, you always need to have the family structure and how these QTLs segregate within each family in terms of genetic gain. If you need to have all these structure, you could say with a classical breeding program and then apply these uh, these tools, then I think for a, for a company, the the, the gain is uh, the abundance is small because uh, uh, you need uh, all these huge investments and then to apply all these tools in order to make more accurate selection. The selection is accurate if you have spent uh, some billions and uh, uh, have a huge uh, problem. I mean, for example, for, for CBAS, we have all this information for the genome of CBAS. Can we save some years or some money from investment? Well, I don't ask that's, for a degree or for uh, CBAS. That's a good no, even, even for very beginning you don't have to, to wait for two or three years which is the generation interval to do uh, the selection in two three years uh, you, you you will have the, the breeder active the brood fish active
to, to spawn. That's, we cannot change, that's biology. Okay? But the decision will be made much earlier. So you don't have to, to wait, uh, because you know that the practice is that you wait for three years, which is the generation of Delta, you select them, and then you wait at least for one year to put them into the system. So, in that way, you shorten the generation interval by uh, being able to select the individual much earlier with confidence and to, uh, uh, you don't lose the information, uh, the one year that's, or two years that uh, you need uh, for later. Now, for adjustment. Now, uh, regarding to the accuracy, you said, he said, if you spend, you have spent so many million to do that, to do what? To have the family structure, mm -hmm. okay? But the, uh, the selection is like, it's proved in uh, Poland. No, no, it works. It's it not works. accurate. It works. Yeah. It works because it has an accuracy. That's why it works. If, if it was not uh, accurate, it, it wouldn't work. But uh, it works because it has a certain accuracy. Can we improve the accuracy? If we can improve the accuracy, uh, we can uh, do that. Another thing is for trades with low heritability. Low heritability means low accuracy from the previous equation. It means low accuracy. Okay. So, how much it will it will pay back? Yeah. It's another one. Yeah. And, uh, now, now we are in a phase that uh, we're not in the phase of the development. We are starting being uh, published many QTS, and we can go to to the phase of the application. I mean, to go and get this QTL region get this uh, this market, check them in our population. Okay, this costs, but you will see if uh, it will pay back. Okay. 